Hi guys, this is Dr. Aeronautics, and this is the very first one of my uh, Orbiter 2010 XR2 tutorials. Um, that's the second... <laughs> Both at once. I was about to say, that's the second time that happened. And um, so it decided that my PC was slow, and then it was like, you know what, I'm going to change that. So I'm going to be like that. Yeah. That sure drives me crazy. Anyway, uh, so now we have uh, this tutorial. And I'm actually not going to go into Orbiter uh, 2010. I'm not going to launch it at all. Because this tutorial is on the config file. The config file allows you to change uh, several things with the XR2. How far it can fly, how powerful its engines are how many people you put on there by default, and a whole bunch of other great things that are not possible on the old thing. Um, the XR2 is basically an add-on. Uh, maybe I should give a little bit of an intro of that first. Okay, so I've opened up the XR2 Ravenstar Flight Operations Manual, and uh, I really love this. Um, it's, it's easy to deal with uh, because it's written in C++ for the most part. Uh, and uh, the great thing about the XR2 is it opens so many different things that the default uh, the default delta glider doesn't do, which is why I don't like it as much. It supports center of gravity shifting. It supports uh, universal MMU, which I'll explain a little bit later in the tutorials. It's basically real living astronauts. Uh, it supports life support, a little bit of life support. Uh, fuel management, payload management, uh, heat control, and uh, acceleration constants and uh, acceleration limits, and stuff like that. So, uh, oh yeah, and it also features, my favorite feature, is that it actually features a mass calculation readout, which means that you can use the natural logarithm equation and figure out exactly to the millisecond when you want to begin burning and you will use exactly as much fuel as I do. Um, I've actually done uh, several orbital mechanics calculations uh, for uh, a trip to Jupiter uh, in which case I added I found the energy required to go from uh, Earth escape to Jupiter and then capture into a Jupiter orbit and I used the same amount of fuel within about 15 uh, meters per second delta V because of perturbations but the point is the the wonderful features allow much more realistic flight which I like I'm a simulationist so I like really real stuff so if we look through here um, so there are the features remember what I said there's not a uh, there is not an obnoxious computer voice for the XR2 the um, on the Delta Glider, you would hear radiate or retracted. And on this, you hear you hear the voice of Sally Beaumont, which sounds a lot more like an actual human because it's a human recording. So it's like those subway trains that you get on, and they'll they'll say stand clear of the doors or something like that. Uh, so that's good. And uh, there, this is actually a, a pack. The XR2 comes with a pack from Altea Aerospace. Uh, the XR5, which is kind of like a cargo uh, shuttle vessel, it can handle, I think, about 15 to 20 astronauts and carry um, about 10 tons of supplies, I think, 10 metric tons. Uh, right. So let's go into uh, the features. So the XR2s... Uh, include uh, so here, here it goes somewhere between 255 and 281 unique sound effects and voice callouts that's fantastic a, um, a special crew uh, and here's the great thing the scram engines don't quit at Mach 6 they operate up to Mach 17 or Mach 20 I usually get them to about Mach 20 on the XR2 as it says here uh, extensive fueling oh yeah that's true there's there's refueling you have to open a hatch to get get the thing to refuel there's actually a mod that allows you to send send 
vehicles around and that allows it to uh, refuel. Maybe I'll do a mod spotlight on, uh, what is that called actually? Uh, UGCO, uh, Universal Ground Cargo Support or something like that. Uh, you can drive fuel trucks around. There's much better instrument display gauges. When, when I bring up the cockpit, the next tutorial is going to be on the cockpit. I wouldn't surprise if I wouldn't be surprised if we spend more than 20 minutes on the cockpits. There's gauges everywhere. Uh, the autopilot is much better, uh, and the efficiencies are are shown on the thrust readout. Uh, and there's also pressure, more pressure gauges. Uh, and also, there's a multi-display area, which is like the multi-display. Um, multi-functional display. Uh, this has the autopilots, it has the temperature statuses, uh, and even has diagnostics, which is really great. And there's also pop-up HUDs, uh, which is great because I won't have to keep on giving atmospheric callouts in thousands of feet because one of the, eight, one of the HUDs uh, converts to Imperial units. So I can show both kilometers and thousands of feet on the screen at the same time, which is really great, uh, and the or in the config file which I'm going to show you. Reentry heating, like I said, uh, you have to watch your hull temperatures. You will heat up and explode, uh, and if uh, if you accelerate too fast, you will die because of over acceleration. And then it has uh, fuzzy logic hull overheating. Uh, if you've done if you've done uh, artificial intelligence programming, you'll know what fuzzy logic is. It's basically a rule set that says, um, I want you to fail at a certain time uh, determined by the computer's uh, internal algorithm. So like it says here, not instantly destroyed, the computer's going to basically decide, okay, I'm going to blow up in the next eight seconds. I'm going to decide to randomly blow up in 7.333 seconds. So that's basically what fuzzy logic is. Um, there's a warning system, not like the beep from my uh, from my uh, alarm. Uh, that's heard in the in the uh, Delta Glider Four. Better autopilots. Uh, there's also uh, cheat codes, damage and crash. We went over that. Um, I think there's a docking mode of uh, reaction control system, but that might just be the XR5. I kind of forget on that one. Uh, the sound effects are much better. Uh, the, the scram engines are realistic, which is great. And so you can see the engine volume is based on the fuel flow. So I really don't need to look down because I generally know how well they're working based on how loud they, uh, they work. It actually sounds like a combination between a moan and a sigh, something like. <sighs> so if if you, if I don't mention it and you suddenly hear um, like someone just going, <sighs> that's the scram jets. There's an APU uh, which you have to watch on. Uh, it runs the hydraulic systems, so if you run out of it, then you can't operate stuff, which sucks. That includes the air flight control services. There's also uh, a coolant system which needs to be uh, manufactured, no, sorry, managed, uh, and then XR2 has the uh, visual hull heating, which means the hull turns red as opposed to the just the plasma cloud, um, and it actually turns white if you push it too far. Uh, there's also a virtual cockpit, but you can't press buttons in it. Um, there's also rotating wheel animations, and uh, you can get on and off the XR2, which is pretty good. There's also, uh, I didn't see it, but there's also turbo packs that you can use, um, which is great. So you can basically exit the vehicle, uh, climb over to the pack, put it on your back, and then you basically become a spacecraft because it, it has jets on it. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you guys to the config file. So if this is your Orbiter 2010 directory, you just open up the location where Orbiter 2010 is. The, uh, the 
Sorry about that. The file is in the config directory, so open up config, and it is called XR2 Ravenstar Prefs. So you scroll down all the way to X. There it is. And you go ahead and double click that to open it like anything else. And now what you're going to notice is this is a, uh, this is a programmed file. So uh, it's a little bit um, tricky uh, if you haven't heard of programming, but, or if you haven't done programming. But basically anything in brackets is basically a title. Um, this pound sign is basically to tell the computer, hey, this is a new, um, actually no, this is to tell the computer uh, that this isn't a, uh, this isn't a value. And there's not one here next to this, meaning this is a entry point. So it's basically, it's basically saying for this value, except zero. And what's going to happen is there, there's another program which grabs that, that value. It says, okay, zero. And then it uses that in the, uh, the simulation. So I'm going to go over each one of these, um, except the ones that aren't important. That's 2D panel resolution. That's basically, uh, that basically just makes sense. Uh, the next thing is the, uh, the MMU mes uh, meshes. This is basically the, what the people look like. Um, there's like six of them or something. Uh, so like, like this Lee, for example, I think he is, um, he's a bald man. And then Kara Miller is a, uh, is a female. And then there's a bunch of male and female meshes here, uh, and they have special uh, designs. Uh, I actually don't like the XR2 suits that much. They kind of make people look like aliens um, because the the suits are skin tight, and they have really weird, um, like space age, uh, space age stuff. I can't really think of anything, but it basically makes you look like a stormtrooper instead of an astronaut. I like the default UMMU ones. Okay, so this is basically um, this is the default for uh, when you load a scenario. If there's not a one in the first place, if there's not a passenger set in the first place overriding it, then you're going to end up with some really weird uh, results. So, uh, first we have uh, a number of passengers. So, when, so it, when it loads out, it's going to load all 14 passengers. And it goes to passenger 13 because the first is passenger 0. So, you basically, um, if you wanted to change the name, you basically type in here. So, if we wanted to change Lee Nash, you would basically overwrite that. And then, and then you go to File, Save, and that takes care of that. Uh, and then there's also age in years, pulse, resting, this is resting pulse in beats per minute, uh, and then mass in kilograms, and the rank, there's only a number of ranks that are actually accepted, you can't just generically name it. Uh, if we go up to here, uh, we might see what the possible uh, ones are. Uh, maybe not, but you can see here there's, there's basically commander, pilot, support, uh, team leads. I don't know, maybe you can uh, name them, but I think if you say pilot, it automatically says, the, the program automatically says, okay, this is the person that's going to fly the craft. Um, and then here's the mesh file, so this one matters. So if you do Kara, it's going to load Kara with the suit, and it's going to obviously load Lee with the suit. And for these other ones, they're more generic shoots, so you can scroll through and see there's, there's a uh, different assortment of people through here. So you basically can change those. Uh, you can actually eliminate, actually no, you can't eliminate um, passengers from the file. Um, but what you can do is it says uh, number of passengers to add to the ship uh, if there's no UMMU data. And this basically says default uh, crew complement is, is 14, but I have it set to one, which basically says I only want the first passenger, passenger zero, Lee Nash loaded if there's no uh, UMMU data in the scenario file. And maybe I'll also go through uh, scenario editing through, through programming as well, possibly. Um, okay, so now we go into the actual meat of the stuff. 
So then we have uh, lighting effects, which is basically a local light source. It basically says, if you're on the night side of space and you turn your engines on, fire shoots out of them and the fire creates light. So it lights up your spacecraft. So uh, it, it's kind of like, hmm. Uh, I can't really explain it because there's no real other... But, I mean, it's basically like saying there, there's a light source and it, it lights up the area that is around the light source is basically what it does. So, uh, obviously, one is enabled, zero is disabled, so one means it's going to be enabled. And then we have the altitude and the vertical speed indicators. On the HUD, uh, it actually writes in the middle the... Um, altitude and the vertical speed right in the center near the pitch ladder for you to read and you can hide that with zero or enable it with one uh, and it lists the default value here I just leave it on because it's handy the HUD also shows uh, distance to the nearest base uh, when you're within a certain distance that you can set so you can uh, disable it if you do uh, less than zero uh, if you do zero, then it will tell you always where it is. And if you do uh, some value greater than zero, which will determine exactly where, uh, it will tell you uh, the distance to the nearest base when you're below 200 kilometers. Uh, and that's generally only done when you're approaching or you're flying a uh, high atmosphere flight. And in this one, uh, it determines whether or not the ship can be controlled by any uh, person. So in this case, zero, any crew member on board can pilot the ship. So if the, and this can happen sometimes based on health, if the pilot and the commander die, which is usually very rare, they're usually the, in the best shape, and it's set to one, then you're stuck because you can't, it, the, the buttons break. You can't interact with the, with the craft. No buttons work, and you're basically stranded. Uh, on zero, any pilot can board, can can uh, any member can pilot the ship I leave it to zero because the XR2 is easy to fly if you if you had permission to, to get on the XR2 and you don't know how to fly it you're stupid as heck okay uh, next we move on to the payload bay fuel tanks in order to reach uh, normal fuel capacity so if we um, if we do zero the choices are 0, 1, and 2. If we do 0, it says that internal tanks are sized at 100% normal capacity. That basically says if you fill up the tanks, it says 100%. But then it says on number 1, if there is no internal scram tank, or sorry, there is no internal scram tank, and the main tanks are sized to only 75% of normal capacity. That basically says if you have one... Uh, if you have one auxiliary, um, in, you, you have a payload bay, and you can you can pack in more fuel. Like you can fill, you can fill a tank with fuel, and then stick it in the cargo hold, and then also use it. I use it when I go to Neptune because it's really, really, really far away. Um, oh my gosh, I have so much fun at Neptune. But um, anyway, so yeah, you, you I just prefer to uh, do it at zero. If you do zero, it will fill up with a, um, a green line first, and then whatever's left over, it will show in a uh, teal color, uh, the, extra, uh, the extra amount in there. And then for two, there's no internal scram tank, and the main uh, tanks are sized only to 50%, which means you need two, um, and that's the maximum you can fit in there, you need two bay tanks um, and the internal tank to reach a hundred percent capacity so then we have uh, the AF control uh, modifier which uh, allows for actually uh, let me read this because I don't exactly remember what this does uh... okay so this is I remember now this is this is dual performance basically what it does is uh, when you're in pitch it basically dampens the strength of the uh, dampens the strength of the uh, air flight control services 
and uh, when you're in full mode, then it then it uh, makes them more powerful, which allows you to uh, better handle the atmosphere. And then you can see here's the increased values here. So the AF control uh, modifiers, the first one is AF control pitch. So this is how much stronger pitch is. Uh, and the second number is AF control on mode. Okay, so it's actually the opposite of, of, of what I thought it was at. 1.30, which means when you're in the pitch attitude mode, it makes the things stronger, so you'll move around more. And when in the atmosphere, it makes them weaker. So this basically um, determines that. Okay, now this next one is very important right here. This is the main fuel ISP, and this is how you fly. So this deals with the main, the hover, and the reaction control system fuel. And it depends on how long your mission is. So here are eight values which you can choose for it. And what it does is it changes the fuel efficiency, not the amount of fuel in your tanks. So what it does is, is like in your car, uh, if you set it to a low ISP value, like 14,000, which is right here, uh, it's kind of like getting 14 miles per gallon, for example. And if we set it to this massive one, 476,000, that's like saying uh, you're now getting 476 miles per gallon. So it takes longer uh, for the fuel to, to drain and you get more bang for your buck. So you can see now um, the values. If you set it to zero, it's deemed expert, and it says you can reach the ISS only with the perfect use of your scram engines and the perfect deorbit and landing. That means no fuel uh, at all. So when you when you deorbit, uh, when you deorbit, you're like the space shuttle. You have no power and you're gliding alone. Uh, the next one is realistic, which is ISS only, and that's basically saying, uh, given the current known technologies, how good could this be? And the answer is about the ISS. So you don't have to be perfectly using these, um, but you do have to be careful. And then there's default, which is basically ISS and moon, so you can get as far as the moon. Then there's medium, which is... ISS and Moon with Reserve, which basically means if you make a mistake, you still have leftovers. And then there's the stock, which basically, um, the stock Delta Glider is the one that we flew for all these tutorials, the first 15. So remember when I said Moon with Large Reserve, it's not designed for Mars. You can see the next one up from here is the Mars one. And the specific fuel impulse ISP uh, is a little bit higher for Mars. So that's the next one. Five is Mars, six is Jupiter, and seven is massive, which means Jupiter with full payload. So you can actually go to Jupiter and put a um, put a box of of um, a box of uh, base. You can put a base, an inflatable base, in your spacecraft, and then set up a base. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, on the later episodes of Norriston Land to Niso, when we get into space, we're going to colonize the solar system, and that's how we're going to move stuff around. So right now, this is saying two, so ISS and Moon. If we were to fly the XR2 in orbiter, we would only get as far as the Moon, and we'd have to be very careful with everything we use. The next thing is the specific fuel impulse for the uh, scram fuel uh, which is basically how long the scram jets last. Uh, you'll run out of fuel quickly if it's zero for realistic, and if you do uh, four, which is ten times normal value, they'll last ten times longer, and you'll get ten times more use out of them. Uh, not totally useful unless you're flying all the way around the world, um, because most of the time you're just using scram to, to get to orbit, and they run out usually after you... Um, after you run out of, uh, after you run into the temperature limitation, that's the other thing. Is the in real the um, the scramjets are in real are like in real life. Scramjets get better and better and better the faster they get. So the limit with them is they get too good. 
they start burning fuel so quickly that they overheat and you can't run them. So what would happen in real life is if you turned a scramjet on when you were moving too fast, you'd blow up. And that actually happens to you if you don't close the scram doors uh, in the XR2, which is very important. Uh, and the next one is as important as this first one. And you have to make sure these values match. This is how long your oxygen lasts, the i.e. the breathing oxygen that your astronauts physically breathe in and out for, for life. It is essential. If you run out of oxygen, you will asphyxiate. So you need to know how long your mission is. And this means full crew of 14. So there are 10 values here, some seven days all the way to five years. Now the great thing is that's five years with 14 people. So uh, you will last 70 years if you were the only person going on uh, default n on nine. And you can actually extend that. Uh, I usually extend it when I go to Neptune with, a few, that, with an oxygen tank in the cargo bay. That's the great thing is you still have a cargo bay so you can just bring all the more oxygen. And then next is the consumption setting, which is like the ISP uh, kind of. Uh, I don't know how this changes. Just because this amount of oxygen goes up does not change the mass of your ship. But this is the amount that it's loaded. Um, now what you can do actually is change the oxygen consumption. So you can, you actually you can even disable it. So if you want to be, I don't know, flying for 10,000 years. I don't know why you would want to do that, but you could disable it if you wanted to. Or you could slow it down 25% of normal, so 70 years times four, so you could last 280 years with one person and the maximum amount of oxygen here. So I don't think I've ever been gone 280 years. So I really don't think you're ever going to get that problem. The only reason you'd be gone 280 years is if you set up a base on in the Jupiter system and then fly to Saturn and then set one up there and then fly to Venus and set one up there and then fly to Neptune and set one up there and then fly to Uranus and then, yeah, you're gone, you're gone forever. Uh, so then we have the LOX consumption multiplier. Uh, which is different than the consumption rate. I think it's yet another value which changes how quickly the mass in your oxygen depletes, uh, which is kind of like this. So if you set this, if you set this to, you know, a low value again, you could again multiply that 280 years and make it even longer. So then we have the main engine thrusting power. This is how much oomph the engines give, how much power uh, they, can, they can move the spacecraft forward. There's two options, 240 kilonewtons and 192 kilonewtons. I use one because it's realistic and it works. There's no, there's no new reason for it. Uh, with the, with the, um, the Delta Glider 4, I use the, um, the Mark V engine, which is the, the cheatiest one but I don't like it when you don't accelerate fast. I, I like quick accelerating um, engines. So that's just my personal opinion on that one. The next one is the hover engine thrust. Now this actually determines whether or not you can take off from the Earth with a, fuel, with a full load. So you can change it from 132 to 168 kilonewtons. I leave it on realistic. There's no real reason to do a VTOL on the Earth. Okay, the next value here uh, is the scram value heating, um, which is basically how quick your scram engines heat up. Um, again, I'm a simulationist, so I like realistic. Um, if you leave it to easy, you can actually use your scram engines all the way to orbit, and you'll, you'll get there, and I've actually done that a couple times. Uh, I think I'm going to do that next time I fly uh, through Jupiter. Uh, because uh, it's much better that way. Uh, next is the scram fuel flow rate. This is how quickly fuel is burned, um, as opposed to ISP, how quickly your mass decreases. So you can change that if you want to. Again, I leave it to realistic. 
Zero is for easy. Uh, next, okay, this is important as well. This is the APU fuel burn rate. This is how quickly your auxiliary power unit fuel, i.e., what powers your hydraulic systems, runs out. So you can actually disable it with zero, uh, and you can go all the way to expert. Um, two is a, is uh, 110, which means you can run it for 110 minutes before it's going to run out. I leave it at two because I do so much, so many opening and closing of doors that if it were on expert, it would run out. If it were on realistic, it would run out. And probably um, moderate, it would run out as well. Um, it's very bad uh, for the APU to run out, and I like to open and close things all the time. So, uh, especially if I'm going to Neptune, I need to do this like probably 60 times. So that's 60 times. Uh, that's 60 times about 30 seconds, or about. Uh, Thirty uh, thirty minutes right there. So then you're down to eighty, and then you're then you deal deal with the atmospheres. So you're going to run out quickly. Um, the next thing is the idle run callouts, which basically says every sixty seconds, tell me that the APU is on if I'm not doing anything with it. So if I'm not using the AF control services, if I'm not opening a door, if I'm not using the hydraulics, if I don't need the auxiliary power unit. The, the computer will tell me it, with a voice call out, hey, your APU is on, you might want to consider turning it off. The next is the auto shutdown of the APU, uh, which is, which basically, uh, if you control multiple spacecrafts at once, which I sometimes do, or if you switch back between a spacecraft or an astronaut or, or select another vehicle, it will automatically disable the APU so that you don't control it, come back to the ship, and you're like, what happened? Like, for example, that time I left the computer and uh, I ran out of fuel and crash landed on Mars off screen uh, and then got back to the computer. I'm like, what the heck happened? So, yeah, it basically does that. Um, okay, and then there's uh, auto center of gravity of shift. This is if you have the, um, the re-entry uh, pitch or angle of attack hold uh, on and you're re-entering, uh, this will basically allow the center of gravity shifter, which needs the APU to turn on. And that will basically automatically start the APU. Um, I like it enabled, um, but I turn the APU on anyway when I get low. Because when the APU is on, it, it makes a whine, and I like that whine because it tells me one of two things. If I'm in the atmosphere, it tells me you're flying like an airplane. If I'm re-entering, it basically tells me junk is going to go down right now, and you better be ready for it. Uh, so then the next thing here uh, is the ship damage due to wing stress, hull heating, hard landings, crashes, excessive dynamic pressure, and scram engine overheating. Uh, and basically, I have all of them enabled. So wing stress would be if you tried to, if you were moving at like 3,000, okay. Watch the end of my, um, watch the end of my ballistics tutorial. I think it was tutorial six. When I get up to like 50 megapascals worth of um, heat, or, or sorry, of pressure and pull like 60 Gs, that would snap the wings off. So that's what wing stress is. Hull heating, <coughs> hull heating is uh, basically the the reentry heat caused by um, air molecules rubbing up against the spacecraft. Hard landings damage is when you basically do one of two things: you run out of hover engine, or you come down carelessly. And you hit the ground at a speed so high that the landing gear collapses. Or you are going for a landing and don't flare. And your, um, your nose gear impacts at like 10 meters per second and absorbs everything. That will blow up your craft. Which also leads into crash damage. Which basically says, if I did that thing where I 
touch the wing to the ground, I'm going to basically get crash and explode. Then there's also door stress. If I left my radiator open when I was re-entering, unlike the Delta Glider, st the stock Delta Glider, if I left my radiator open, it will break, the APU will overheat, and I will die because the oxygen will go out. So then we have uh, scram engine overheating, which is basically the scram engine. I explained that. And then there's damage well docked. And that basically says, um, do you count all of these things if you're docked? In this case, I have it disabled because of um, Norsden Land to Niso. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be riding on board the uh, I'm going to be riding on board ah that's what it is um, I'm designing a uh, I'm designing a reentry shell for the planet Jupiter it's basically a heat shield shell you basically dock with it and um, it basically it basically absorbs all of the heat impact and then you blow the shell off when you enter the atmosphere so that enable damage while docked is for my um is for my creation so that when when i'm in the heat shield it won't say you're overheating um, because although you can re-enter on jupiter it takes like 10 hours i've done it once and it's the boringest thing ever um if i ever do a tutorial for re-entering on jupiter um, it's only going to be like the first five minutes and I'm just going to have to say trending. This is what we do. And then I just have to like take pictures of it from there. Cause it, it, no joke. It's like 10 hours to re -honor. It's ridiculous. Um, the next is, uh, thrust due to atmospheric pressure. So what happens is when you go into the atmosphere, the atmosphere, uh, pushes against your rocket nozzle and it pushes back. So you have to push harder. So it's basically the, the pressure of the rocket minus the pressure of the atmosphere. There is a point where you go into so much pressure that your rockets cannot, um, they cannot overwhelm the atmosphere and your engines are useless. Uh, this is a static pressure constant and it only happens when you go below a certain height on Venus or you go too deep into the gas giant atmospheres. Uh, the next thing is uh, flight control service input when the autopilot uh, is engaged. Like basically it says it prevents you from fighting the autopilot while you're trying to helping, uh, while you're trying to help it. So basically um, when I have the autopilot engaged, it won't let me control the joystick or the, uh, or the throttle. I have it disabled and I prefer it that way because... Um, because that way, the, like that one time I accidentally turned the hover engines on, if I accidentally bump it, it won't come on. Uh, and then we have uh, inversion of uh, the y-axis inversion, like in normal games. Uh, descent rate, arrow behavior, uh, that's not really important. This is the, the voice of the call-outs, how loudly you have them set. I like them 255 because the engines are loud. Um, and then it 1500 feet or whatever you want to say here uh, the ba thing will basically say clear to land and then you have um, choices when you when you take off um, there are uh, things that you can use so you can you use wheels up lift off or positive rate uh, on takeoff and uh, wheels down and touchdown for uh, for these things um, the the fold is wheels up and wheels down, but it confuses me because if you say wheels up, I suddenly think that the gear, the landing gear is up or retracted. And when you say wheels down, it makes me think that the gear is extended. So when you say wheels up and I'm taking off or wheels down and I'm landing, I panic because I think that the gear is moving. So um, positive rate just sounds too nerdy. So I go with lift off. For takeoff and touchdown for for when the wheels hit um it, it just sounds much better that way so that's what i go with um also uh when you cross through mach 1 you will hear a <laughs> which is basically the sonic boom um it's a little bit unrealistic if you're outside that works if you're inside you don't hear a sonic boom when you're inside 
as seen on the Concord, the only way that you tell you go through the speed of sound is you get a sudden drop in the dynamic pressure, and that's basically the um, that's basically the pressure, uh, the compression wave crossing through through the sensors, the pitot tubes. Okay, and then we have um, voice call out. So if I if I didn't want it to if I didn't want it to say welcome to the spacecraft then I could say zero and then it would not welcome me to the spacecraft or if there was a problem and I didn't want it to say morning everything is wrong I think something is wrong with me then you basically uh, set that to zero and that works um, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff like information callouts so if, if it's if it's telling me attention this is happening you can disable that as well uh, and then you basically have how quickly the computers update. I have them set to very low values. Uh, I don't know what the the values are typically set to, but um, I have a very quick. This this is my um, this is my brain. My brain has a very quick refresh rate, which means um, like the old monitors, if they operate at 60 hertz, I can see that as a computer screen flashing. When I go into public places and, and I see uh, LED lights, I see them as quickly flashing instead of just on. Um, I'm sure there's like other there's a lot of other people out there that can also see that as well, um, but I just uh, that's just too quickly for me to see. So when I actually fly um, on flight simulators, they have them set to like half a second or a quarter second, and it drives me crazy because then I can't do mental trending in my head. I see a value and I'm like, okay, is that going up or down? Is that going up or down? And I have to wait. I mean, it's half a second, but still, I mean, it makes a difference for me at least. Uh, so then, then you can choose where you can resupply. So unlike the Delta Glider, which would magically resupply anytime you doctor touch down, you can actually determine which fuels are available where. So if you say allow um, dock, or I'm sorry, allow ground resupply if you land on Mars, the Moon, Earth, Ganymede, uh, Venus, it will it will give you the option to refuel your main fuel, your liquid oxygen. Uh, in this case, it will it will choose choose what you get to use. So I have it set so that I can refuel my main, my liquid oxygen, my APU, and my scramjets on any ground and then there's one that says allow an earth only resupply that is only when you're touched down on the surface of the planet earth are you allowed to supply this and that is um, that is uh, typically scram but I go to many planets with many atmospheres and I prefer to have it set otherwise so um, I don't have any on earth only resupply so it's blank so then we have, um, yeah, so then you can, you can prevent refueling at all if, if you disable all of these. And then allow dock resupply this basically. When you dock, you can use these things. I do that because I usually dock with motherships, so they just have stuff. Um, and then there's internal cooling system, heating rate. Okay, so this is how quickly the, the APU heats up. So I have it set to realistic. Um, which is 63 minutes, which basically says if I fly without the radiator open or my cooling system on, which it only works on the ground, I will overheat. So you can't fly in the atmosphere at high speed for more than 63 minutes. So what I usually do is I slow the spacecraft down and actually open up the radiator in flight, which works because the radiator is uh, aligned with the path of motion. So it's like a knife moving through air, uh, which works well. Uh, but they really should have a better way to fly through the atmosphere. Because the great thing about the XR2 is it's an atmospheric-friendly craft. I prefer the XR2 when I fly in, in another planet's atmosphere. And I prefer the um, Delta Glider 4 when I land on a planet without atmosphere. Because it doesn't have scramjets and all those other things that are meant for the atmosphere. And then this is the default... Um, this is the get rid of the magic refill, which I just told you about for the stock Delta Glider. I don't like it, so I disable it. And then uh, this allows 
uh, 2D panel scrolling. My screen is big enough so I don't need to scroll it. Uh, and then there's basically the sounds. So custom, uh, custom sound disabled means you play the default sounds. So whatever the main engines, the hover engines, and the RCS sounded like in the stock Delta Glider from my older tutorials, that's what it sounds like. But if they're all one, which they are, you will hear new sounds. So the main engines sound much more deeper and powerful because they are. Uh, and then there's the hover engines, which sound differently as well. And the custom RCS, which sounds deeper because it's more powerful and larger. And then main engine, I like hearing engine sounds, so I have that up high. And then there's basically, you can change the, the many HUDs that are inside the XR2. You can change the values of the colors. So you can change the, the color. Uh, I just leave it. Um, and then there's a funny feature here called fuzzy dice. Like in the um, in the old, a lot of times uh, with antique car shows, they'll hang fuzzy dice in the mirror. There is a rear view mirror in the XR2, and you can hang them from it. Uh, I disable it because um, it's serious and stuff. But when I fly in my fictional star system uh, as a uh, as a warrior, um, the the XR2 is designed as my special personal craft. I have it custom colored and everything, and I enable the fuzzy dice because it's kind of like my limousine. But normally I fly with it off. So then we have uh, the animations of the hatch, um, which are enabled while docked, which basically say um, the, the hatches, you can see them. If you go outside, you can physically see the hatches opening up for a, a refuel. Then there's cheat code settings, um, which I think, I've never used it before, but I think if you set it to zero, it basically disables almost everything in this list. So then you basically, there is a secondary HUD mode, which I use. Um, it it shows, there's one for re-entry, there's one for docking, there's one for atmospheric flight, there's one for ascent, and there's one for orbital flight. So um, those five, you can change the colors. I like them because they're actually great. The atmospheric one is blue, which works because it has a background, so it doesn't blend in, but it's blue, so it makes you think of the atmosphere. The orbital one is green. I like green uh, for when I'm in space. The reentry one is red, which makes me think fire. And the the um, the docking one is like a blue, which is just like, well, okay, gray, blue docking, that, that works. So it's fine. Uh, and then, okay, this is, you can basically um, change, this is all the options for the values that you can have. So if you wanted a custom uh, HUD, this, if you did a little bit of programming, these are your options that you have to, um, to paste in. So you can use all of these and you can custom build in a HUD if you want. Um, so here you can see the, the colors and the backgrounds. So here, here's the first HUD, here's the second HUD, and it shows you basically in the first row left column, first row right column. So look, here it is. Altitude and metric and imperial. So on the left you have kilometers and on the right you have thousands of feet. Then you have static and dynamic pressure, which I like to watch all the time. And then you, and uh, these are in, <clears throat> actually these are in imperial. I should change that because I do not like PSI. Um, I never learned PSI, so I just don't like it. And Pascal makes so much more sense. Um, because consider this, the atmosphere is 101 uh, kilopascal. That's a round number. Whereas um, the atmosphere in Imperial is 14.7 PSI, which is a weird number. So I don't like doing that. Uh, and then, so here's the other HUDs. Uh, and then cheat code values, which are allowed. So basically, this is the empty mass of the Thing. If we set it to zero, the thing would be lighter all the time and it would move much faster. If I set it to zero, um, we would move almost from zero to infinity. We'd probably crash the game if I set it to zero. Uh, the maximum cargo that can be in the cargo bay. So if we go above this value, it's going gonna, it's gonna to squawk and be like, hey, there's too much weight in the bay. I can't take it. 
So the next thing is the payload range grappling, which is how close can a box be nearby for it to be loaded? And it basically says uh, when it's on the ground, 400 meters, and when it's uh, in the in the orbit, 22 meters, and then you can basically load it. So what I do is on the ground, I drive with the UCGO mod, I can actually drive the stuff around and then drop it off at... Um, <clears throat> I can drop it off at the um, at the XR2, uh, which is handy. And there's also another mod which allows for um, universal cargo uh, stuff that the XR, or sorry, the um, the Delta Glider 4 uses, uh, which is handy. Uh, so I can actually load with scram, load with extra fuel, and load it with a base and stuff, which is kind of handy. So then there's there's tank capacities. So here's the main tank capacity. You can change that to scram tank capacity. Again, I mean, I guess if you wanted, you could probably get infinite fuel by changing these values up enough. I never change these. They're not really useful. Here's an ISP overwrite. Okay, so, so this is, remember the value up here, which I said was incredibly important. Um, <clears throat> here it is. So this is the value here. It says 40,000. Um, which is basically an override cheat code. Oh, okay, so when it said cheat codes enabled or disabled, um, it's basically it's basically the stuff under here. So I can set main, yeah, I can set main fuel ISP to 9999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
you basically stick this in here and then you can basically use the UGCO cargo. So here's a picture of an XR2 uh, right here. It bears a lot of resemblance with the SR71B, which is another reason why I like it is because it, it really is a beautiful craft. Um, and you can color it as well. So here's the cargo bay, and this is basically what's in it. And um, so here's an oxygen container. This is extra. Remember, I said you can put extras in there. There's an extra oxygen tank. Here's another one here. There's two extra fuel tanks which are here, and these I think are inflatable bases. So you can basically set up two bases, have two extra tanks of fuel and two extra tanks of oxygen. It's very useful. Um, so that's basically that. Now, as for the operations manual, here is a picture of the Altia um, flight or, or sorry fleet. So there's there's three of them here. There's the XR1, which is an upgraded version of the Delta Glider stock, uh, and here is the XR2, and that really is a beautiful craft. I love looking at it, especially um, the Raven Red is the one is the one that I use. Um, typically, at least for the fictional one, um, where I go around flying to all the, the different star systems. Um, the, thing the thing is colored black and what red, and it looks really awesome. And here is the XR5 Vanguard, which I said is a huge um, cargo carrying thing. This entire thing here is a cargo bay, and this are the windows for passengers. So it's a huge ship. It's actually so large that it has an elevator which um, brings people from the ground into the spacecraft. So we'll go through a little bit of the manual here. I don't want to spend too long doing it. Um, but basically here's a um, okay here is a picture of an XR2 um, panel. This isn't the one that I use um, but basically you can see there's a fuel display here and this isn't the confusing one. The confusing one is the one that I use, uh, which is the thin one, I think. Yes, this is the one that I use, and it has gauges everywhere. Here's the uh, vertical speed and altitude callout. The nearest base is also displayed here when you've taken off. Here's a secondary HUD that I told you about. Um, and then there's also a... Uh, Okay, Vanguard. So this is actually the XR5 Vanguard, but it's almost similar in every way. Um, hang on, is this the XR... It's not the XR2 special. Okay, so this is a Vanguard, but um, basically, you know, that's that. And then you can configure it. We went through that. Uh, then it goes into all the gauges. Uh, here's all the limits, so I'm going to scroll through this slowly, so in case you want to pause the video. We're going to go through these limits um, on the first tutorial. <clears throat> so here's all of the limits there. There's more at the bottom, uh, but we'll worry about those later. There's more gauges here. Um, okay, here's a picture of the uh, XR2 Raven Star at the top of the atmosphere with its scram engines on. Again, beautiful craft. Here's a picture... You can really see how large this XR-5 is with it docked to the International Space Station. And the docking mechanism is actually on the top. So that's that. Um, and there's also refuel lines here. Here's a picture of the coolant temperature gauge, which is the, um, the stuff that cools the um, auxiliary power unit. When this goes into the red, you're basically done for. So you have to manage that. Oh yeah, there's also timers, there's temperature indicators. Here's another picture. Which one is... Uh, that's not a picture. Okay, here's here's a picture of the turbo pack. And this is what I said made you look like an alien. Because like I said, it's skin tight. And it has these weird things on the side. Um, I'm just not into this kind of um, picture. Th uh, um, this kind of art. There's uh, Commander Lee up there. This is the nose cone open right there. There's no ladder. That's what the XR2 is missing, is a, is a payload ladder. This is a picture before docking, uh, and there's payload slots and stuff. And here's more stuff. 
So um, without further ado, uh, this is the end of the tutorial, and I will see you guys next time for the... Uh, I probably just got cut off by there by two seconds. So um, I will see you guys next time for the uh, panel introduction tutorial.